Good morning. It's already been a good morning, has it not? Um, I want to just highlight a couple of things before we jump into uh, our passage this morning. Uh, it was mentioned uh, by way of announcement and also through uh, Teresa and our children's uh, story that school is starting. And that means this tonight at 6 o'clock, we have a back-to-school prayer drive. And um, I would encourage you to come out and pray. We meet at the church here. We have a brief devotion. Then we break into uh, groups, and we go to all the schools in the community here. And uh, I can think of no finer way to uh, really show our support uh, for our children, for our teachers, the administrators, everybody, than to uh, lift them up in prayer. And I think it's not only a, a good thing for us to do um, spiritually, but I think it's a good witness, too. I haven't gone out without in, in, encountering some teacher that's coming in or out of the building every time I've gone. And, and uh, they always ask, why are you here? We've come to pray for all of you for this coming school year. So um, I would encourage you to do that. Um, second, if you're new to the church, this was drawn to my attention last week. Uh, someone asked me about uh, the thing on the screen and th the poor guy was trying to write everything down. And there, uh, there's notes in your bulletin uh, that follow along with the PowerPoint and there's fill-ins if you're a note taker. If you're not a note taker, there's no quiz at the end. Uh, so, but it's, it's there as an aid for you if that's a helpful way for you to retain things and just uh, take home what God is teaching you today, okay? Um, and we're going to pray in a moment. Uh, I think also I, I talked to a few people at 8 o'clock, and I think I've got this heating and cooling thing solved because, you know, temperature in the sanctuary, some people are cold-natured, some people are always warm, uh, but if you do get cold, you can go to the corner because it's about 90 degrees there. <laughs> if you didn't get that, check with a math teacher, okay? Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your house with your people. And Lord, we thank you for how you've already spoken to us uh, through music, through a children's message, and through dance. Uh, Lord, um, I thank you for the reminder uh, through Sila's dance that um, we are created as your masterpieces. And Father, um, I thank you that you still see us as a masterpiece, even when we are sinners who have fallen far short of your glory, who have unknowingly and willingly been disobedient to you. And Lord, we thank you that you see the potential in us and that you ever work to draw out that potential in us. And we know that ultimately, God, our most fulfilling life, a, a life that um, demonstrates who you are and all we are meant to be, happens as we are people of faith who trust you wholly and completely with our lives. And so, Lord, we pray this day that as we again look at your word and see how you worked in the lives of the people of Israel, that you would help us to take it home, that you would help us to apply it to our own lives so that we might grow in our faith, in our knowledge, in our understanding, and in our love for you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We are in week nine of our series, The Red Sea Rules. Uh, the context is uh, the, uh, the children of Israel, the people of Israel had been enslaved uh, in Egypt for 400 years. And God raises up Moses to uh, lead them and deliver them from captivity. And... Uh, 
you know, there were 10 plagues, everything led up to this, and then they, they, are, they are on their way out. And they get to the Red Sea, and they have this impediment in front of them. They have a sea in front of them. They have mountains on both sides of them, and they have the uh, Pharaoh's army, the Egyptian army behind them. And last week we saw that God made a way where there seemed to be no way and opened up that Red Sea and created walls out of water and the people of Israel passed through on the other side. And so we're up to uh, number nine. I'm going to review real quick so that we can uh, uh, get our context. Uh, Rule number one was to realize God means for you to be where you are. Whatever trial, whatever situation you're in, God has a plan, and he knows what you're going through, and he, uh, he, he means for you to be there. Um, number two is to be more concerned about God's glory than your relief. And sometimes that's a difficult thing, but we need to step back and know that God has a bigger plan, and he has a bigger vision for your life and mine, and so we, we need to look, uh, what is God doing? What, what does he want to accomplish in this through me? And number three is to acknowledge your enemy because we have an enemy of our souls, the devil, but we keep our eyes on the Lord because he is greater and we can trust him through everything. Number four is to pray. Uh, we, we need to be people of prayer. It says the people of Israel cried out to God and in their crying out to God, God responded. And number five is to stay calm and confident. I believe that's what Teresa was reminding all of us to do is stay calm and confident uh, and give God time to work. Uh, His time and our timing are often different, and so we need to allow God time to work. And number six is when you're unsure, you just take the next logical step of faith. Don't be a deer in the headlights, but keep moving forward in your walk with God and your trust of him. And number seven is to envision God's uh, enveloping presence. God is truly with us. He never abandons us. He never forsakes us. We can trust that he's with us through everything. And number eight Uh, We looked at last week, trust God to deliver in his own unique way. And I think, honestly, I think God sometimes delights in surprising us. I, I, I think uh, he, he, he has a sense of joy in uh, a kind of uh, doing things outside the box and out of the way in which we might expect or think, uh, just like making walls out of water. And so this morning, then, we're going to look at view your current crisis as a faith builder for the future. Follow along with me as I read from Exodus chapter uh, 14, verses 30 and 31. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. And Israel saw the great power of the Lord used against the Egyptians so that the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. So you see, God had these people who he needed them to grow in their faith and their confidence of him. Imagine if you, if you can that you are, um, you are a descendant of 400 years of slavery. That, that you, you know nothing but what it is to be a servant to others. That you're, you're not, uh, you, you don't make your choice for any given day. Uh, you are told what to do, where to go, what you can and can't have for supplies. Um, Your food rations are determined by someone else. Uh, You have very limited power in your life. Imagine what that must be like and what, how that affects your psyche, how, how you, you think about yourself. And then God shows up and God intervenes and God makes it clear, you are my people. You belong to me. 
and I am going to liberate you. I am going to set you free so that ultimately you will not just be my people, but you will have a place where you belong. You will have a land. You will own property. You will earn a living. You, you, will, you will be supplied all these needs. Can you, can you imagine the, the, the transformation that's taking place? And God needs to build this. And what I'm telling you is what God did for Israel, God wants to do for you and me. He, he, he came to liberate us from our sin, from our brokenness, from our own, our own sense of I can't. To knowing that God says, you can and you will through my power. So we, we, we need to view any obstacles that come in our way, any challenges, and understand that God is, his purpose is to build your faith in mine, in him. Um, it's been mentioned several times, school starting. Well, usually when you say school starting, there's two responses. A groan uh, or excitement. The great thing about school is there's this, there's this annual reminder that there's need for us to grow. Grow intellectually, grow physically, uh, grow emotionally, uh, and and that is also true spiritually. We need to grow in the Lord. And one of the ways in which we grow in the Lord is to deal with those challenges in our lives. This, a scripture that I'm going to give you, is not on the screen, but um, it came to me afterwards. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. James basically starts his little letter with this important counsel. He says, Count it all joy, brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. God wants you and me to be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And one of the ways in which that's accomplished is through trials, is through challenges, is through hurdles. And the reason for that is, the fact is, trials for us are treadmills for the soul. It's like going to the gym. It's like getting fit, spiritually speaking, uh, when we encounter various trials it helps us exercise our faith in the living God. Hudson Taylor, that great pioneer missionary to China, said of God, he said, I know he tries me only to increase my faith. He said, that's the only reason. I, 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 his trust in God was, you're doing this so that my faith will grow in you. What we're going to do at this point is we're going to look at a number of different individuals throughout Scripture that exercise faith, um, much like the Israelites, and, uh, and hopefully take some applications for ourselves. In Luke chapter 1, you have the account of Gabriel uh, appearing to Mary, and he tells her that she's the chosen one. She's the one who is going to bring the Messiah uh, into the world. And, and she says, I want to be the servant that God wants me to be. She says yes uh, to God. And she goes and she visits her cousin, uh, Elizabeth, and Elizabeth greets her with this proclamation. She says, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was promised to her from the Lord. She's, she's pronouncing this blessing upon Mary, but she's saying the key is that Mary believed that she had faith in God to do what God promised, what he proclaimed that he would do. 
In Romans chapter 4, you have uh, the Apostle Paul writing about Abraham, uh, the father of Judaism, the father of faith, and he says, No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God would be able to do what he had promised. He's referring to Abraham believing that God was going to give him a son through his wife, Sarah. And it says he didn't waver in his faith. Do you remember how long that took for that promise to be fulfilled? 25 years. 25 years. Abraham was 75. I won't ask for a show of hands, but are there any 75s in here? And you're going to wait another 25 years to father a son? Yes, exactly. Janet's laughing. I mean, it is laughable. No wonder they called him Isaac, which means laughter. I mean, the thought of it is is comical to think, okay, a 100-year-old and a 90-year-old are going to care for a toddler. It's just, it's just, uh, it's comical, but our sense of timing, our sense of anticipation, God was faithful. And Abraham is a, he is honored uh, in a position of being the example of faith because he trusted for 25 years and he knew God would fulfill. Another example uh, you can find in the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul um, <clears throat> is being taken uh, to Rome. He's going to stand trial. Uh, he's in a ship. And uh, there's a great storm that comes up. And uh, when the sailors of the ship are afraid and they're throwing cargo out, they're throwing basically money out to save the ship, you're in trouble, right? That's not a good situation. And the apostle Paul appears up on deck and he tells them all this. He says, for this very night there stood before me an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as it has been told to me. Don't be discouraged. Don't be overwhelmed. I know that God's going to deliver us. And he did. Um, In Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, referring to Sarah, says basically the same thing that Paul said about Abraham. He says, by faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive when, even when she was past age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Now, I want you to notice there's a connection there. It says she received power because she believed the one who had made the promise was faithful to it. There's, there's a power that actually happened within her because she had faith in the promise giver that he was also a promise keeper. That's a vital thing for us to understand that there's real power that happens. Again, a scripture that um, came to me this week because I've been studying the Gospel of Mark because we're going to do a uh, Bible study in the Gospel of Mark starting this fall. And so I've been, I've been working my way through the Gospel of Mark and probably one of the saddest passages to me in scripture is found in Mark chapter 6 where uh, uh, Jesus is at Nazareth and he, uh, he goes to the synagogue and... Um, and, and he teaches, and they don't believe. 
uh, because they said, well, we, we know his mom. We know his sisters. We know his brothers. And, and Jesus responds, and uh, he, he says that uh, a prophet uh, is honored everywhere but in his own town and by his own family. And then he says these words in verses uh, 5 and 6. He says, and he, it says, and he could do, he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. He could do no mighty work there. He just healed a few people. And it says, and he marveled because of their unbelief. So Jesus' ministry, um, his miracles, the things that he did around Galilee, well, predominantly uh, he did them other places because he wasn't going to do them um, in Nazareth because they lacked faith in him. Again, from the Gospel of Mark, and it is on the screen, chapter 4, uh, we have an account where Jesus is in a boat. Uh, he has told the disciples, we're going to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Let's get in the boat. Now, remember, he's not the fisherman. He's the carpenter. But he's, he's telling the disciples, and, and they get in the boat, and it says that he reclined in the boat, and he fell asleep. And up comes a storm. And they are afraid that they're going to die. And so they woke him up. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased. And it was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? You can almost hear the disappointment in his voice here. That, that, that somehow they don't have faith in the one who's in the boat with them. And you know, um, a storm could come up anywhere in anyone's life, but the key here uh, that demonstrated that they didn't have faith, when you read uh, the, the story there, Jesus told them, we're going to the other side. If Jesus tells you you're going to the other side, I'm telling you, you're going to get to the other side. You don't, you, you don't have to worry about it because you're going to get there because he said, we're going to the other side. And so when the storm rages and comes up, you need to remember what Jesus said. And no, I can get through the storm because he's already told me we're going to get to the other side. I like what Warren Worsby says when he declares that a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. Faith will be tested, will be stretched. Um, it doesn't become faith if there's never any resistance whatsoever. And in Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter, it gives us a very, very important definition of faith. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Faith is the key here. You know, uh, too many times people get caught up in this idea that I need to be good. I need to be a really good person. And if I'm a really good person and I do things right, then I will please God. No. You need to be a person who really trusts God, who places your faith in God, who understands I'm a sinner and Jesus died for my sins and he is perfect and I am not and I trust him and what he did on the cross for me and therefore I surrender my life to him. Now will that produce moral upright character? Absolutely. But it will be done through faith in the living God because you, you understand God knows what's best for me, and therefore I will do what he tells me to do in his word. And guess what? What he tells me to do in his word are the right things to do. But you don't do the right things to earn his favor. You trust him. You see the difference? You trust him, and then you follow after him 
because he is trustworthy. Second thing that we need to do and understand when we're, uh, <clears throat> when we're going through those crises, and we sang about it at the beginning of the service, is standing on the promises builds faith. That we stand on the promises that God has made to us. Um, in Mark chapter 9, you have this wonderful account. Jesus and uh, Peter, James, and John, he takes them up on the mountain what we call the Mount of Transfiguration, in which Jesus is he's transfigured. He's brilliantly white. They see him talking to uh, Elijah and Moses, and, uh, and the other disciples are down below, and they're dealing with a family crisis. They're dealing with a father who has a son who's a, a demon-possessed, who has just been fraught with all kinds of uh, difficulties because of that. And Jesus comes down from the mountain and encounters this father who the disciples can't cast out the demon. And so um, you read this account. Jesus said to uh, ask his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. And if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. You can understand where he's coming from. The disciples couldn't do anything. If you can do anything, would you please have compassion and help us? That's not faith in Jesus' mind. That's not a good definition of faith. And, and Jesus said to him, if you can... If you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. And I love this dad's heart because he loves his son. And he wants what's best for his son. And he cries out there immediately, the father of the child cried out and he said, I believe, help me in my unbelief. I believe, I, I, I know it may not be much, but I believe, help me in my unbelief. Let me ask you, where's your faith quote, quotient? How, 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 uh, how much faith do you have? Is your faith full? Or is there some unbelief? Do you need some help in that area? I, I would venture to say, because the scripture I gave you at the beginning in James was uh, uh, God wants us to be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing, Anybody here perfect and complete, lacking in nothing? Okay, so we got a little bit more faith to grow in, right? Right? We, 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 we can learn more in our trust level of the living God. Again, a quote from uh, history. Thomas Watson, not our Thomas Watson, the Puritan uh, uh, preacher of old, said, faith lives in a promise as a fish lives in the water. The promises are both comforting and quickening. I love that. I just love that because it, 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 it gives us a great word picture. Uh, a fish is totally dependent upon that environment of water, right? They breathe in oxygen through the water itself. They move around freely. They, they, it's, it's their environment. A fish on land, that's a bad, bad thing for them, right? Good for the fishermen, but bad for the fish. People, that flopping fish on the ground is you and me when we're not living in faith. We're gasping for air. We're struggling to stay alive. We're not in the environment we were meant to be in. We need to be in that environment of faith and trust in the living God. Second Chronicles chapter 20, we have an, an account of another uh, mighty movement of God. Um, the Amorites and the Moabites have come to uh, uh, take over Israel. And they grossly outnumber uh, King Jehoshaphat and uh, his, his army. And so he calls for a nationwide 
prayer and time of fasting that God would save them. And uh, everyone is praying for God's deliverance. And um, Jehazareel, uh, a, a Levite, prophesies to the king and tells him what God's going to do. And he said, listen, all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid, do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours, but God's. The battle's not yours, but God's. And the next day, they got up, and they went to the battlefield, and they went up on the watchtower, and they looked out, and it said, everywhere they looked, there were dead bodies lying around. They did not lift a sword. They did not shoot an arrow. God did it all for them. You ask why? Well, we'll ask why when we get to heaven, but I have a, a sneaking suspicion that the reason why is because the people united prayed and fasted and asked God, deliver us. And he said, I'll do it because you have faith in me. I'll do it because you're trusting in me. J.I. Packard, a uh, great preacher and uh, theologian, says, In the days when the Bible were universally acknowledged in the churches as God's word written, it was clearly understood that the promises recorded in Scripture were the proper God-given basis for all our life of faith and that the way to strengthen one's faith was to focus it upon particular promise that spoke to one's condition. What he's saying is that there was a time, and I pray it's still a time in this church and in many other Bible-believing churches where we look to the Word of God and understand that God's Word is true and therefore, when I'm facing a life situation, I look to the Word of God for the promises of God and trust God for the fulfillment of those promises. Why is it so important to God for us to have faith and to exercise that faith in our lives every day? I'll close with this illustration that I hope will make it personal and help us to understand why this is so vitally important. To the best of my ability, I have tried to be a good father to two people on this planet, Justin and Emily. And uh, a part of being a good parent is to do what you say you'll do, fulfill promises that you make, be there when you're needed. And I can tell you, I have failed. There have been times when I've said, we'll do, and I'll make sure we can do this. And circumstances and conditions prevented me from doing what I wanted or committed to do. And even with that said, I'll tell you this. Tomorrow, if those two young people suddenly decided that they didn't trust me anymore, that would totally crush me. It would crush me to think that they couldn't trust me. And yet, I tell you, and I stand before you as your pastor, and I say, I am a sinner. I am fallen. I am not worthy of trust. But it would crush me if those two human beings somehow didn't trust me anymore. And I am so imperfect. But there is a God who is absolutely perfect. He is faithful. He never fails on his promises. He loves you and me so much he went to the cross for us. Now, can you understand why your faith and my faith in him is so vitally important to him? 
He is worthy of our trust. And when we don't place our faith in him, when we doubt, when we waver, man, he doesn't deserve that, does he? He deserves wholeheartedly for us to take him serious and commit ourselves all the way. And when we do that, nothing but building and growing will happen in our lives. Pray with me, would you? Almighty God, I pray on behalf of myself and on behalf of these dear people that I love. I pray as the Father who spoke to the Lord Jesus. Lord, we believe, help us in our unbelief. We believe, Lord. We trust you. We know you loved us enough to go to the cross for us. We know, as Teresa reminded us today, that you are with us. And Lord, help us to grow in our faith to understand that every hurdle, every trial, every challenge in our life is an opportunity for us to know you better, to see your power at work in us, to be reminded through our own personal experience that you are the deliverer that you are the sustainer, that you are the perfecter. And to know that you are ever working to make us complete and perfect, lacking in nothing. And Lord, we know and we acknowledge that that complete and perfectness won't happen until we see Jesus face to face and we are made like him. But until that point, you are ever working too bring us to that. And so, Lord, as your people, I pray you would help us to face each and every trial with great faith and trust in you. And Lord, I pray for any here this morning who have not yet taken that first step of faith and said, Jesus, I trust you to be my savior, to forgive me and cleanse me of my sins and to open up my life and set my life on the path that leads to heaven. Help us all, Lord, to move ever closer to you as we trust you more and more. We pray in Jesus' holy name, amen. Our hymn of invitation is, uh, My Faith Looks Up to Thee, and as we stand and sing this hymn, as always, I invite you, If God is tugging at your heart to give your life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I invite you to come and share that with me. It would be an honor to pray with you. If God is prompting you to join this church family, to pursue baptism, to uh, maybe you just want prayed for by your family of faith, you feel free to come and respond as God is prompting. Don't let any insecurity keep you away from responding in faith. Let's stand and sing together.